The following interview was conducted with Jane Daniels, Director Emeritus of the Women in Engineering Program for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October 30, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Sure. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, grew up there until I got married and came to Purdue. So it was a long time in St. Louis. Um, I was born in 1946 and lived there until 69. And uh, my father was a grocer, and my mother worked with him in the store. Um, he did the meat cutting and um, purchasing and that kind of thing and mom did all the bookkeeping and the cash register and from the time we were about knee-high to a grasshopper we started doing work in the store. Um, my brother was three years older than I am and the two of us would start out doing things like pulling the cans forward on the shelves and then as we got a little bit older we were allowed to carry people's groceries to their car or to their home. It was really a neighborhood store and as we got older um, we would be allowed to check out our own groceries for our family and then gradually they'd trust us enough that we could actually work as cashiers at the store and that was we knew we'd become important then. <laughs> <laughs> Little entrepreneur, right? Right. What was grade school and high school like? Tell us about what your activities. Um, I started out we lived real close to the store through third grade and so um, I really don't have a whole lot of memories from K to third grade but um, af at fourth grade, we moved to um, an area in St. Louis Hills, which was about a half hour from the store. And um, then I really start remembering uh, friends and activities and things like that. Church activities were probably the most important, um, and Girl Scouts at, at the grade school time. Um, I always liked music, so I sang in the children's choir and um, sang in the choirs at school. I played violin. Um, played in the orchestra in all, the way, all the way through high school, yeah. Um, and those were the major things. How large was your class? How large was the high school? Well, it's interesting. St. Louis had an odd school system that they started classes in January as well as in um, September. And so I was a January child, and um, our class was very, very small. In grade school, um, by the time I got into the sixth grade, we were in a gifted class for people that it tested well, and um, there were only 12 in that class. Um, and then, of course, when I got to high school, that January class was about 110, and the June class was more like 400. So together, which we now celebrate, you know, the year of graduation was 1968, and we all get together, and, and there's about 600 of us. Okay, so it was just graduation in the spring, even though you, you said No, no, we graduated in January. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was when they still uh, went to school after Christmas break, and so we graduated like in the end of January. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, then what uh, transpired after you graduated from high school? Then what was next? Um, Washington University, not leaving St. Louis. Uh, it's really interesting. Washington U at that time was not nearly as national and international as it is now, and so um, when I started there, I'd pass people from my high school classes as we went from class to class. I joined a sorority, Delta Gamma, and there were people in sorority that I'd gone to high school with. So it was much more um, local than it is now. I commuted, I lived at home. Um, my brother was an architecture student. He, like I said, he was three years older than I was. He also went to Washington U, so we drove back and forth together. Um, and just uh, had a really good experience. What, what, any clubs or anything like that in college? Yeah, on campus, in addition to um, the sorority, I was involved in the Campus Y, and at that time, they did a lot of community outreach, so I did tutoring in some of the poorer school districts in St. Louis, and uh, we also did a lot with international students. So once every other week, I think, we would put on a luncheon for the international students. That were at, this, at Washington University? Right, oh, and that was real of, interesting. Were there was, quite a few in those days? Mm, yeah. Not compared to now. I okay. mean, like maybe 30 or 50 or something like that. And we would make lunch um, for them and then sit down and eat with them and talk to them, which was uh, my first exposure to anything international. You can imagine with my parents having a grocery store, we didn't go on vacations. We didn't travel very much. So this was kind of like the first spark I had of right. And interest. there probably weren't any international students in your high school either. Oh, no. Mm -mm. As a matter of fact, our high schools were very um, 
segregated in those days. I think there might have been three or four African American students. Um, I don't remember any Hispanic students or Native Americans. Sure, right. But it's a pretty lily white environment, I'm afraid. What did you do during the summers in college? Did you work during the summer in the, in I the did. store? I did. I um, did. Not always in the store. By the time we got into college, um, mom and dad had certainly hired help um, that they really didn't need us anymore. They probably never needed us, but gave us work so that we could earn some money. But um, in the summer during college, I was a camp counselor most of the time. Um, like I said, I graduated in January, so I was very young. Um, when I graduated from high school, I had just turned 17. And so instead of starting college in January, I worked for um, a travel agency, um, Cook. I, it was an international travel agency. Right. I don't I, remember, I remember much about name. it. Yeah. And um, I worked there until classes started in September. So that right. actually was a longer sure. period of time. Okay. Then what was next after you finished college? Then what was your plans? Well, uh, <laughs> to get a little bit of confidence since I'd never left home, and even when I graduated from college, my mom and dad said, well, why in the world would you move out of our home if you're going to work here in St. Louis? I mean, they just couldn't understand that concept at all, that wanting to be on your own or anything. That was completely foreign to them. So for the first year after college, um, I was engaged to be married, and my husband-to-be was already working here at Purdue. And so um, for that year, I worked for the welfare department in St. Louis as a caseworker and uh, lived at home and just uh, did that kind of work. My career goals really when I came out of, of college were to be a high school guidance counselor. And when I came to Indiana, three days after I got married, um, I found out you had to teach in high school to be a counselor in the high school. And in I, Indiana? Yes, uh -huh. and I had never wanted to teach. That just didn't interest me at all. I didn't have any education courses. What was your major in college? Um, sociology. Okay. Uh -huh. And it was a time of a great deal of unrest, and it was uh, 64 to 68, so there were campus demonstrations. So sociology was kind of a neat place to be at that time. But when I came here and found out I couldn't be a high school counselor with my credentials, um, it wasn't long before I started taking graduate classes here on campus. I really want to tell you about my first job at Purdue because it was the neatest there ever was. I worked for WBAA for the campus radio station. And it was a glorified clerical position, um, but I was a music librarian. And so I got to record times on classical music. And I, I mentioned that I just love music. and so. That was like a dream job. Um, all day long, we'd listen to music and get it ready to program for release on the air. Um, Johnny DeCamp was the station manager, and he was just. Tell us a little about Johnny. Oh, yeah. my gosh. What a wonderful man. He was such a character. Um, always had kind of a crusty story to tell us, and we would just laugh. But every day, he would have us come into his office for a staff meeting at about 4.30, quarter of five, and he'd fix tea, and he'd have little biscuits or cookies or something, and a bunch of us would sit around his desk and just talk. And that was just one of the neatest he things. He shared a lot of memories and things with you. I'm he sure. did, he did, because of course he had been at Purdue as a student, and then he was the voice of Purdue football, and right. he worked at the Indianapolis 500 on their broadcasting team. So in the month of May, he would take us down to the racetrack sometimes on Friday afternoon or Saturday. And he was just the best. I, I dearly love him. And his wife, uh, before she passed away, Anne, was, was just wonderful and good to everybody that worked at the station, often would have us out to lunch or dinner. and. Just, um, really nice. She was a nice lady. It yeah. really was. Their offices were in Elliott Hall of Music? Mm -hmm, down okay. in the basement. It's still there, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, Dave Bunty and Roger Priest were working at the station at that time. And now I'm sure, d I think Dave was station manager at some point in time. I think Dave time. is retired, I think. Is yeah. he? I think so, yeah. All right. But made some friendships there. How did you get there? your first job? Where, where did you live when you came here, too? Um, we lived in um, oh, Beaujardin Apartments here in West Lafayette. So um, we lived there for the first two years we were here, and then we built a little home in Lafayette. Um, so that did was you our, your husband yeah. while you were in college? At I actually met him um, when I was about 12 years old <laughs> or 14 years old. He worked for my father in the grocery store, and he truly married the boss's daughter. 
<laughs> and he, he kept was, in touch all those years too. Mm -hmm, we did. did. He was a little bit. Uh, no. Oh. He was a little bit older than I was, and he went to Southern Illinois University for um, his bachelor's degree and his master's. And um, when he went away, I was in high school, and he said, well, would you write to me while I'm there? And I said, sure, I'll write to you. And it just blossomed from there. He would um, take me out on a date once in a while when he came home to St. Louis, and every once in a while he'd invite me down to Southern Illinois. And of course, for a 16-year-old to go to a college campus, my dad and mom had to take unbelievable ribbing from the other guys at the store. <laughs> You're gonna let her go. <laughs> yeah. So they always <laughs> adored Dale and <laughs> thought he was like a second son to them. So sure. they were. They'd known him for quite a while too. Very long the, time, right. and they knew his okay. family. And well, then go on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about after, and then we'll move into the uh, the women in engineering. How you got involved with that? Sure. You asked um, how I got the job at yeah. WBAA, and that right. was just through a placement agency. I had signed up at Purdue Personnel, and um, also at a, a place in town, and um, got an interview with Johnny and. And went on from there. Good. Yeah, okay. and then real interesting transition from that to kind of more professional work. Um, in 1972, I was about a year away from getting my master's degree in counseling, and um, Gunnar Kularud was the head of the geosciences department at that time. He was a Norwegian, I believe, and he was broadcasting on WBAA an introductory course to geosciences. And it was my job to go with him to the classroom, mic him, um, take notes so that if he would point to an illustration in a book or point to the board, I would have to break in on the tape when we got back to the studio and say, at this point, Dr. Kularud pointed to the illustration on page 36 of your text. Well, as we walked back and forth, he said, you know, what are you doing? I was taking classes um, for counseling, and he said, well, we could sure use a counselor in the department. We don't have anyone except the faculty to talk to the students when they visit, before they come to Purdue, and once they get here. Would you be willing to come work for us part-time? And I thought that was great, because it was right about the same time that our son was born. He, he was born in 1975. And um, so I thought half-time work looked really nice. And so I um, went to work for the um, geosciences department, and I was there for six years doing student advising and counseling. So that's kind of the transition that got me ready for my work in freshman engineering. Mm -hmm. okay. And my friend Marie McKee, Marie Kaniga at that time, um, was the director of women in engineering. And she would always talk about how interesting her job was. And Harold Amran was the head of freshman engineering. That was her boss. And she said, he is just the most wonderful person to work for. And she really liked all the people in the office. So um, when a position opened up, she said, why don't you send in your credentials and interview over here? So I did. Um, it was for a half-time position, which is what I was still interested in. By this time, I think Kyle was about four. and. Um, he, um, they hired me to do student advising and to help Marie a little bit with the women in engineering program. Well, a year after I was there, um, she got hired to be um, in personnel at Corning Incorporated in New York. And so they were looking for a new director and Dr. Amrine talked to me about it. And I said, I just don't wanna go full time yet. And I know that job would require a full time person. So. They hired another director for a very short period of time, and she didn't like the job at all. And I cannot to this day imagine why, because I thought it was the best job at Purdue University. I really did. I thought it was terrific. Was she new to the university? or No, she'd been in financial aid. Okay. Um, she, she said she thought it was very stressful. Um, I, I never felt that way about it, but maybe it's just what you enjoy doing and what you don't enjoy doing. Let's go a little bit back in time. When did the program really get up and running? Well, the program itself started in 1969, okay. and it was the first program in the United States. Um, no other college or university with an engineering school had thought to do anything about women in engineering. So um, it was the same time they started the minority program. And I guess um, Arthur Hansen was the president of Purdue, and he and Harold Amrine um, talked a lot about it, I guess. And the dean of engineering at that time might have been John Hancock. Um, and they decided this was a real need. And 
I think as I talk about the beginnings of it, uh, or did when I was here, there was a drop in the number of students studying engineering. And they looked around and they said, where are we going to get more students to study engineering? And I think it was kind of self-serving. They realized that there were a lot of young women out there. There were a lot of African-American students, Hispanic students, who were just missing from the student population in engineering. And if they were looking for new students, this was a pretty good place to start looking for them. So they started these two programs. Um, hired Marion Blaylock to, or I guess there might have been one person before her, but I think she was there very early on. And Donna Froreich was hired um, to be the director of women in engineering. And then um, it grew. Um, her first, uh, the first task she did when she got there was to find the women's restrooms in each of the engineering buildings and make a map for the beginning women students so they would know. And in most engineering buildings, there was one bathroom, no matter if it was a four-story building or a whatever, how big it was. And usually it was the staff for the, for the staff. There was nothing for students? Not women students, <laughs> because there weren't any. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when they started the program in 69, it was about 1% of the student body in engineering was female. So. Um, they thought they could make do with the secretary's bathrooms, and that was fine. But that was her first task was uh, that she did. I think I don't think anybody told her to do that, but she did these little maps that have mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and <laughs> civil engineering and show where the restrooms are. Interesting. And then she started doing some high school programs, um, reaching out, and that's um, those two things were the the major things that were still in existence when I became the director in 79 or 80, I think 80 before I became director. Um, but in between, uh, Donna and I were Christy Smith and Marie Knega at that time, and, and then this woman named Kathy Flora who was just there for about nine months, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so I became the director, and um, yeah, this is full time. So you knew that, so you decided they offered yeah. you on a full time basis. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And when they offered it the second time, I said to Marie, I called her up at Corning, and I said, "What do you think?" And she goes, "Well, opportunity has knocked twice now." <laughs> she said, "What do you think?" And I said, "I think I better take it." <laughs> she said, "Yeah." So yeah. I just, um, it was absolutely a dream job. I loved what I did. The, working with the students was phenomenal. And the, the chairs, first Harold Amryan and then Dick Grace, were so willing to let me dream with what the program might become and what we might do. Um, we had some expansion right in the beginning when I was there. Um, not too long after I started, we tried the, um, and I think it still exists, the Earhart program where women engineers could choose to live together in Earhart Hall. And um, what we were trying to do was to make the environment as positive as it had been for male students at Purdue in engineering all the time, where if you had problems with a calculus class, all you needed to do was go out in the hallway of your hall and there were five other engineering students studying. Well, for the women that wasn't true because there was one here and one there and one over there. So by having the program in Earhart, um, it really helped, I think, get them together. And then we also started a tutoring service in Earhart Hall that was open to both male and female um, students. That was probably, I think, uh, the biggest change right around that time was that most of our programs were not exclusive for women. It was probably 95 to 100% attended by women, but um, we did not exclude men from coming to meetings of the Society of Women Engineers or from some of these programs from the tutoring service because then you start running into questioning are you doing um, more for women than for men and if so why and is it fair and all that. So um, from about that time on many of the programs were open to male students guys. as well as females. So, um, do you, you, um, you did some counseling then. Uh, tell us, you did some testimony for that Commission on the Advancement of uh, Women and Minorities in yeah. Science and Engineering. Tell us yeah. about that, how that came about. Well, starting in the um, 80s, nationally, more and more colleges of engineering started realizing that there weren't very many women studying. And so 
Um, then the national government got involved and realized that they needed to do some support. I think it was in the mid-70s that um, the Women in Engineering program got a grant from some, a group called WIA, which was the Women's Educational Equity Act, which was mm -hmm. part of the government. Mm -hmm. Um, and we used that to actually get the freshman seminar for women students off the ground, and that continues today. Um, so this a ComSat group was um, held hearings all over the United States to get people that knew something about women in science and engineering to help them understand, help the Congress understand why there weren't more young women in these fields of study. And so um, I went up to the one in Chicago and testified uh, with some of the things we'd done at Purdue. Um, the consequence was when they published the report, they actually cited Purdue as being an exemplar mm -hmm. um, for recruitment and retention programs for young women because right. we'd had such success. And did you see more programs start to uh, generate us and they use you as a re uh, Purdue as a resource? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that was kind of the... Um, the reason WePan was started. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about there that. There were two of us, Susan Metz at Stevens Institute of Technology and I, that had been at it a long, long, long time. And as the 80s came along, we would get so many telephone calls from colleges and universities saying, we've read what you did at Purdue, we want to start a program here, can you help us, what can you tell us? You know, how can you keep us from starting at ground zero that we can understand what you've done and what worked and what didn't work and that sort of thing. Well, after Susan and I fielded, you know, hundreds of these calls probably, in the late 80s, um, they had just begun the program at the University of Washington and a woman named Suzanne Brainerd was their director of women in engineering. And she had Susan and I really looking at what we were telling people and she said, you know, this isn't a an effective way of doing it. You two should talk to a group of people, not just everybody calling you individually. So we sent out a little flyer from Purdue to every dean of engineering in the United States, and we said, if there was a meeting about women in engineering, would you be interested in sending someone to attend? And within about a month, we got back 115 replies that they would like us to do that. So we went to the National Science Foundation with this box of replies and said, what do you think? And we went to the Human Resources Division in the um, ed Education Directorate and we went to the Engineering Directorate and they both were very interested. Um, Suzanne Brainerd was particularly good at writing proposals. So was she at Purdue? No, she was the one that's at University of Washington. Oh, okay. And so the three of us, Suzanne Brainerd, Susan Metz and I, got together, wrote the proposal, got funded, and held our first meeting in um, Washington, D.C. in 1990. And at the meeting, after it was over at the end, we said, where do you want to go from here? Do you want to form a, a committee as part of ASEE, the American Society for Engineering Education? Do you want to form a group that's part of the Society of Women Engineers? And they all said, no, we want our own group because when they were at the Society of Women Engineers, they were with students and they were thinking about their students and that was the focus. And when they were at ASWE, it was all about education and the classroom and curriculum and teaching. And so they really wanted something that was separate for people that were concentrating on programs and, and doing outreach and that sort of thing. So in 1990, we um, incorporated a group, and it was called WePan, and at that time it was Women in Engineering Programs and Advocates Network. And just about four years ago or three years ago, um, they changed the name, but they didn't want to lose the acronym because now it was quite well known from 1990 until 2005. Um, so now it's Women, let's see, Women in Engineering Proactive Network. And it still concentrates on programs, but it's certainly expanded to think more about faculty programs, women faculty, um, graduate education, which we didn't do much of until the 90s here at Purdue. Um, we really concentrated on undergraduates until 1990. Mm -hmm. so. What are some of the things that the group does? And uh, you're involved, are you still? Sure, I am. Yeah. Um, I was the founding president, and then I right. served on the board for about six years. 
1990. Does it have a headquarters? or uh, They do now. Oh. Um, it, uh, the headquarters was here for many, many years, and Kathy Denno in the Women in Engineering office is still on the WePen staff part-time. She's director of member services. Um, so it was here for a long time, and then, boy, probably about seven years ago or six years ago, we hired a director, and she started working out of her home and finally got an office. Um, she lived in Denver, and now she has a, an office on the campus of Denver University, University of Denver, um, in their women's college. So it's a, a good place for her to be, and they've expanded the staff a little bit. She now has some clerical assistants, too. And, uh, and what are some of the things that they're doing now that they've added on? Uh, some new just tons of things. Um, we still do an annual conference, and actually this summer it'll be held um, jointly with the American Society for Engineering Education, so one day will overlap so that hopefully some of our members that don't belong to ASWE can go to those sure. sessions and vice versa. Um, there's about 700 members now. They have a website, or we have a website, that has something called the WePan Knowledge Center, and that was um, funded initially by the Engineering Directorate of NSF again, and um, it's a place where people can go to get information. So if you were at a college or university and you wanted to start um, a residence hall program for women in engineering. You could go to the Knowledge Center, find out what colleges and universities have them, how long they've had them, what kind of documents they've published, have they published papers on them, have they uh, published evaluations of their program, all those kinds of things. There's bibliographies in the Knowledge Center, there are um, statistical information, so people are always asking us, well, how many, what's the percentage of women in engineering this year? And of course the frustration was from the mid 80s until this fall, 2008, there was no change in the percentage. It would go, hmm, <laughs> you know, up 1% down 2%, up 2% down 1%. It was just terrible. There was just not much growth. It got to 20% females in engineering by the mid 80s and then it would not go any higher. Hmm. This fall, for the first time, I think they saw a 3 or 4% increase. And of course, now everybody's anxious to see if that'll start another trend upward. Because sure. right. it, it surely had a lot of people doing a lot of things to make it happen. You hope that it pays off one of these days. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, let's talk about the Society of Women Engineers. Um, sure. And it's liaison and things of that sort. Right. Um, um, some of the events and things that you. Yeah. It was National? established here at Purdue. No, or, no, it says, wasn't actually. Um, or Gamma Del uh, something I read said uh, first established at Purdue in fall '46 is the Gamma chapter of Phi Omega. Phi, yes. Alice Balding. Right, well, but that was not. not the the Society of Women Engineers when it started was on the East Coast. Okay. And it was working women engineers, um, and one. I don't know, maybe three collegiate chapters, and I only remember two of them. It was Drexel and Cooper Union, um, Drexel in Philadelphia and Cooper Union in New York, and it might have been a school in Baltimore or something, but anyway, it was all East Coast, and then the, the women that were working as engineers in those three cities is who actually started it. The interesting thing is Purdue chapter of that Pi Omicron became a... a chapter of the Society of Women Engineers in um, 57, so that was three years after the national organization started. I believe that we're the only section, though, that has existed without stop since that day, because I think the sections that started at Drexel and at Cooper Union went inactive for many years and then came back later on. So as far as I know, we're the oldest section. On uh, a continual basis. Because, uh -huh, because right. we've continued for the whole time. All right. So Purdue um, was the longest running section, so in that regard the oldest. And there's activities that have gone on both here on campus with the Purdue section, but also nationally. And the two groups work very closely together. The national organization has just grown and grown and grown and grown. The Purdue organization was um, actually larger at the very beginning, probably because it was exciting and different in the, um, the early years. When I became director in 1978, there were 700 members on I, campus. On this campus? Mm-hmm. 
And what's really interesting, there were 7,000 in the whole organization in the United States. So the Purdue students, not even the alumni or anything, but just the current Purdue students were 10% of the organization. So you can see why they've always really cared what was going on at Purdue and, and that sort of thing. Um, that was the year also that we won the Outstanding Section Award in the United States. So that was exciting. It was, the conference was in California. Um, it was the year of transition when I was just becoming the director and SWE advisor. Um, and Marie McKee was out at the convention for representing Corning Incorporated. Uh, they have an uh, industry fair every year. And so she was there when the section got recognized as being the top section in the country, which was just which really, was really nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. So um, the kinds of things they did on campus, we worked a lot with the Women in Engineering program and the Society of Women Engineers together, which was really kind of unique and nice. Um, the Society of Women Engineers was great because it was new students every year, new leadership, excitement, enthusiasm. Um, that could really do some wonderful programs, particularly for high school students. The nice thing about having the Women in Engineering program advising the society was that you had the continuity and you had the support of Purdue's administration. So for instance, when we would have our scholarship dinners every February, um, and boy, that grew and grew until we gave away more than $10,000 worth of scholarships each um, event. And um, the president of the university always attended. The dean always attended. Many of the vice presidents and deans of other schools like science um, would be there. So it was really, really a big event. Then they began adding the corporate um, job fair and holding it on the week that Engineers Week started. And so the Society of Women Engineers would have a luncheon. They would have a job fair all afternoon, and then the Society of Black Engineers would have their awards um, dinner afterwards. So it was really quite a, a day's activities. Let me ask you, when it first got started, they didn't have the job fair, it was just a luncheon? No, it was oh. just, um, actually it was a, an awards program held often in Violet Haas's home. She was the SWE counselor. The way they differentiate that is that the SWE counselor has to be an engineer. The SWE advisor can be a university administrator or staff person. So I was the advisor at that time. Violet Haas was the counselor, and she would hold them in her home, and the students would be recognized for their academic work or for their leadership in student organizations or whatever it was. Well, it must have been a smaller group. Yeah, yeah. very yeah. small. Yeah. I mean, usually it would recognize maybe 20 or 25 yeah. students. And was that supported by the uh, where the scholarship money came from? Corporations, corp usually. Uh -huh. Okay. As, as they grew and grew, not only did the, the number of corporations that were interested grow, but then we began getting gifts from alumni. And I think part of that was two-sided. It was either alums who as students had been active in the Society of Women Engineers or the Women in Engineering program or both, or those who had thought there was no need for that when they were a student, and then they got out working as engineers and they realized how important that experience helping them, supporting what they were doing could have been. And so they would give back. And um, then we began having, having quite a number of um, alumni um, gifts for scholarships at that event. And um, so now when, it, when students are recognized, it's often an alum that's uh, either representing their corporation giving the award or representing themselves. Right. And you have an they have an advisory board too. Right. Okay. That also started in 1978, right as I began working with the program. Not before I was director, but right as I began working with it. Um, they started the Industrial Advisory Board. It was um, Corning and Aerospace, uh, Procter & Gamble, IBM, a handful of employers that still support Society of Women Engineers and the Women in Engineering program to this day. Right. And there was something for the graduating seniors. Didn't the dean have them to their home? Right. The reception the night before the awards program, usually um, the dean did a reception in his home. Yeah. Very nice. I always say his. Now we, got, well, now we have to say his or her home. <laughs> right. Their home at their home. Right. right. Um, and the scholarships were really pretty good. And they had that brunch. Um, 
Let's uh, talk about some of the programs at the Women in Engineering. You have Career Day right. and some of the other yeah. new ones or ones that are continue on. In 1978, when I started, the main two programs were Career Day, which was for high school juniors and seniors, um, and the Engineering 194, which was a freshman seminar for students as they began. And those can both continue um, to be probably the most important backbone programs. Um, the Career Day program got so large that we split it. Now I understand it's back together, but we split it so juniors would come one time and seniors would come another, and you could kind of address their needs a little bit better. Um, we started inviting parents to participate in the program because one of the things when I was director I realized is a lot of the young women put a lot of stake in what their parents say, even though the parents don't always believe that. It was really important to these young women that their parents agreed with their choice of major and their choice of university. And so I found by um, pulling the parents to the side and while the young women were out in uh, the engineering labs or talking with our students, that gave them an opportunity to not have their parents hovering over their shoulders when they were talking student to student. Sure. I would take the parents and for about two hours usually um, just answer their questions start off with just a real brief introduction about Purdue and engineering and what it was like for women students, what we were doing to try and make it a good place for women to study and uh, be, and then just answer their questions. And year after year, the questions never changed. They're afraid that if their daughters chose a career that was not traditional, it wasn't teaching, it wasn't nursing, it wasn't something that girls always did, they wanted to know if they were going to be okay. And were they going to get here and be made fun of? Were they going to get here and have it be so hard that they couldn't finish? They couldn't enjoy college because they had to work so hard for their classes? So a lot of it was just reassuring the parents that, no, you know, we were there to make sure that there were no unnecessary obstacles. Yes, it was hard, but if you liked the mathematics, if you liked the coursework, if you liked the the end result that you saw that an engineer could really make a difference for humankind. Um, it was engineers that developed pacemakers. It was engineers that developed all the diagnostic equipment mm -hmm. that we use in medicine. It's engineers that clean our air and our water. If you could help the parents understand that their daughters were going to be doing something that really would make a difference in the world, then it seemed like they were much more What about did they ask about the career, what, what goes on after college? Was there any kind of career questions that parents might raise? Sure. Support, uh, financial support. Yeah, oh, financial support was always important. Um, and of course the corporate scholarships were something that if a student majored in English or history or something else, there were no corporate scholarships. It was you were either eligible for financial aid or you weren't. Whereas in engineering there were some other opportunities. Um, so that was there. You asked another question that I'm oh, not about thinking. the career thing. Looking, oh, they ask about, well, yeah, they know, would ask they get what their careers. daughters would do. So one of the things we started doing pretty early on was having a panel of alums talk. And when I would invite them, I would always say to them, talk about what you do as an engineer, but also spend some time talking about what you do after work. Do you have a family? Do you participate in music in the community or um, what, what activities do you get involved with and it was those kind of things I think that with both the girls and their parents um, helped them understand that you didn't have to give up everything to be an engineer. Many of the women that had small children would bring the children with them to career day and so they'd sit up on the panel and be balancing a one-year-old on their <laughs> knee or be holding an infant in their arms and yeah. it just made help the parents and help the students understand that you can have a lot of things in your life. And again, the good thing, the reality is that women are working. So why not work at the highest paying job you can get with a bachelor's degree, which is engineering. Right. So if you don't want to commit yourself to four years of medical school or two years or three years of law school or whatever it happens to be, the most money you could ever make directly out of a bachelor's degree is in engineering. And in most cases, the bachelor's is the, fi is the uh, final degree for many. For, many. for, for that for many. particular field, uh -huh. that's right. Uh -huh. What about a question uh, to, from the parents? The students can participate in activities, hopefully, Absolutely. outside. Yeah. That'll add to it. So 
Yeah, and that kind of reminds me of two things. One is the women participate in activities to a much greater percentage than the male students do. And so we typically had, of the 12 or 15 engineering discipline organizations, although there'd only be 20% women, you'd often have 50% of the presidents of those organizations would be female. So they just enjoyed the activities, they enjoyed the leadership roles, um, and, and became that and participated in that way. The other thing I think was important is to see that you didn't have to have tunnel vision to a technical career, that you could be a, a well-rounded person. And um, my favorite story in that regard is Donna Van Klompenberg, who was on our industrial advisory board. I don't know if she still is for many years. She wanted to be a ballet dancer, and she was going to go to school and major in ballet. Obviously not here at Purdue. Um, her senior recital of dance, she was dropped. She was, um, Prince, Prince Charming was carrying her, and she was Cinderella or whomever, and he dropped her, and she fractured her ankle. And she said, I got up, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm not going to depend on some guy hoisting me above his head. And she said, if I can't be a ballet dancer, I think I'll be an engineer. <laughs> and every time she would say that to a group of women students, she'd get a huge laugh. Yeah, right. Well, she right. has had a wonderful career for Cummins Engine in Columbus, Indiana, and she teaches ballet in the evenings. <laughs> That's what she gets. She, she had both. Got she got her cake and ate it, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, Purdue, the women in engineering has marked 100 years. Did Purdue. They did. Um, I remember when we found out that um, the first woman alum to get a degree from Purdue was 100 years, I believe it was in 2000 or oh. 1999, something like that. Yeah. Um, and we had a, an artist here on campus um, commissioned to do a painting for us that had a picture of Martha Stevens, who was the woman that got the degree 100 years plus ago now. Um, Janice Foss, who I think is probably one of our most famous women alums, uh, an astronaut. And Amelia Earhart, who although she was not an engineer, she certainly had a big influence on women in technical areas. She was a career counselor here at Purdue, right. as I understand it, and um, she had quite an influence on young women doing non-traditional things. Right. So I remember that portrait. It hangs in the Common room over in Enad. Uh -huh. It's very nice, uh -huh. nicely done. They had the uh, program. I was there outside MSWE when they unveiled it. Yeah, yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, um, the liaison with the minority engineering program. Ken, how did how did that work? Yeah, and you said it were established about the same time. Right. Uh -huh. And I think um, because they were both housed in the same department, there was a lot of um, collegiality and a lot of cooperation, cooperation and collaboration, doing things with the organizations. Um, what was interesting about Marion Blaylock and I is we were graduate students together. And so we had both gotten our master's degrees in counseling um, in the mid-70s, early 70s. And when we were on the staff together then, it was just, we're almost like sisters. I mean, we really are very close and friends um, in addition to being colleagues. And so I think that made it very, very easy for us yeah. to work together because we... So that, they were started about the same time as, as when you took over? Okay. Um, the, the you minority, mean the program? The minority. No, been going they before. both started in 69. Oh, okay. And so when I came in 78, um, Marion was already established there. And um, she had finished, like I said, her degree, I think in 72 or so when I did. Um, and then, or 73, and she had been in the Dean of Students office for a while mm -hmm. and then came over to right. run the minority okay. program. Um, how about some awards and honors? Any that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> Personal or the program? Well, the biggest one for the program was, was the Presidential Award for Mentoring. I mean, that was very exciting. Tell us a little about that. Sure. Um, we haven't talked at all either about that group of programs. Um, the Sloan Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation representative came to campus one day to meet me and to talk about our programs. And when we were done, he said, well, I want to fund you. I want to give you some money to do more. I think you're doing great things. And he said, and I also want you to tell me who else I should give my money to. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we want to give money where it's a well-known, um, excellent engineering school where they have a women in engineering program. 
And I said, you're not going to find many others because, interestingly enough, where the women in engineering programs thrived was where the schools were not quite as good. And so they couldn't get the best women students without some effort. And so you found more of a second tier of colleges and universities where the women in engineering programs were um, creative and strong and new. So um, I said, there's a handful, you know, Stevens Institute, University of Washington, Ohio State, Cornell by that time had a good program and, of course, wonderful engineering school. Um, and it was interesting as when Henry Yang was dean of engineering, and he's a Cornell alum. So he was very excited to have us work with Cornell and help them get started. So there were just a handful, and that was who Sloan funded that first year, was Cornell and University of Washington and uh, Purdue. And I what think did it was that just funding lead to? What were you able to do with him? Broaden your program? Um, we started a mentor and mentoring program, okay. which led to this presidential mentoring award, which is what made me think of it. Okay. Um, we started with both an undergraduate program and a graduate program in 1991, I believe. And that was when we hired Emmy Wadsworth to, um, to initiate that program. So when we won the, the presidential award in 1997, um, I said to Emmy, it's your work. You know, it, yes, it's the program, and yes, I'm the director, but I had nothing to do with the program. It was all her work and her baby and her ideas. Um, so she went to Washington, D.C. to get the award, um, met Bill Clinton, and um, it was a very exciting time for the whole program. Yeah, that's great. You didn't go with her, huh? No. <laughs> she was allowed to take a guest, and doggone, she took her husband. <laughs> <laughs> he could have been busy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was um, the biggest award that recognized the program mm -hmm. uh, rather than an individual. Probably about, the mo uh, one other thing. Uh, what about staffing too? Uh, yeah, staff. uh, before Emmy came on board part time to do these new Sloan initiatives, um, Janine Reclitus joined the staff half time, and there were a couple reasons behind that. Um, her joining the program, primarily, I wanted to spend more time. It was when WePan was starting. Um, I was also invited in 1993 to be the first program director at the National Science Foundation for Women in Science and Engineering. And so um, before all that happened, or as all that was in my mind and in the plans, um, we knew we needed more staff to take care of the program. So um, Janine came on board to do, um, at first, primarily the, um, the career days and the um, Engineering 194. The, mm -hmm. the seminar for freshmen. And it was also at a time, I believe, this all coincided. I served as director of counseling in freshman engineering when Dr. McDowell retired, uh, when Dick McDowell retired. And I think I did that for maybe two years. And so it was during that time that the women in engineering program really needed additional sure. staff. Right. Okay. So um, Kathy Denno had been our administrative assistant for many, many, many years now, and she's still there. Janine's retired, Emmy's retired, I've retired, <laughs> and now the program's run by um, two wonderful young women who um, are both Purdue alums, and um, one in engineering and one in science, and um, just doing a terrific, yeah, terrific good. job. Yeah. Well, do you have any more awards and honors you, did you, that you thought Yeah, of? two personally probably that were highlights for me. Um, one was a campus honor, and that was the Helen B. Schleeman Award. And I think, when I think of the w Dean of Women here at Purdue, Dr. Schleeman and Dorothy Stratton and Beverly Stone and Barbara Cook, which, by the way, Barbara Cook was my first professor at Purdue. The first course I took here was an introduction to higher education, and she was the instructor. So when I got the Helen Schleeman Award, it was just like, oh, this is awesome to, right. to be recognized uh, with a woman's name that I respected so highly was just really touching. Um, externally, um, when Dick Grace was our department chair, he was wonderful about nominating the staff for external awards. And so um, the American Society for Engineering Education recognized one person each year with the Vincent Bendix Award for Women and Minorities in Science and in, or in Engineering. And the reason that was so memorable is that the hoopla they do at the annual meeting for these awards is unbelievable. They have a 
a huge screen behind you and they do a slideshow of almost like a this is your life sort of thing and really make you feel very, very special. And so that was probably the yeah. external award that meant the most. That's great. The reporting structure, um, it was it always in university student services? Is that where? Right, but you reported engineering to the head of Yeah, engineering. we always reported through freshman engineering okay. when that was the name of the department. And then when we began doing things for graduate students and for uh, women faculty, that seemed kind of an odd place to reside. So both the minority program and the women's program were moved into the dean's office, or we reported directly to the dean. And then now that they have an engineering education department, which is broader than just freshmen right. students, um, I believe the reporting structure is back through the Tell us about when, when the grad students and faculty, what sort of things would you plan to, or, or the, to those environments? Right. right, and part of this was with the Sloan uh, money also. We developed, excuse me, um, an interactive theater program where we tried to help faculty and teaching assistants understand how women um, receive instruction differently than men in the classroom. And so um, the Purdue Theater Department did vignettes based on questionnaires that the students filled out. You know, what happens to you in a class when a professor asks a question and four white males are the only ones that always shout out answers and none of the women do and 90% of the men don't. It's always usually four white males or five white males that interact in, in with the professor. So we would do a vignette that would show that kind of behavior happening, and you ask the faculty, is this the best way you want your class to interact? And of course they don't. They want to interact with all the students. So based on some of the research, we would suggest that if you wait five seconds uh, before asking, choosing a person to respond to, you'll get a much larger variety of people offering to respond. Also, if you establish some very easy rules at the beginning of a class, such as if a faculty member says in the very beginning of the class, now when I ask questions during class, I don't want anybody to shout out answers. That's not what we're trying to do. He said, I want you to think about the answers, and then I'll call on someone from among the people that have their hands up. Just by doing that simple thing at the beginning of the semester and then actually doing it during right. the year. This has the stage you all of a sudden have something like 70 to 80 percent of the students in your class talking with you and responding instead of four or five. So it, we, we did vigne vignettes like that with the theater department um, and that was part of the Sloan grant too. Mm -hmm. um, and then the women faculty issue was actually one of our alums that um, kind of instigated some of the um, interactive workshops that still go on today that um, look at culture, what is the culture of engineering like for, um, how comfortable is it for people that don't come from the traditional background. Engineering started as a military subject and so there are many, many students nowadays who just don't respond to that. They don't respond to a faculty member standing up in front of the classroom and lecturing for 50 minutes and they sit there quietly and take notes and go on their merry way. Um, when industry started doing more team work in manufacturing, we saw the same kind of thing come into the curriculum, that um, faculty wanted to get more interaction with their students, but they didn't know how because they'd never been taught that way. So um, through this uh, workshop that um, Deb Gruby through DuPont helped us initiate on campus, that was an idea to look at what was the experience like for women students, women faculty, what's the experience like for African American and Hispanic and Native American students and faculty, um, and let's talk together so that we can do some better things than have been done for the last hundred right. years. Very uh, good, good ideas. Yeah. Right. We have about three minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple, we have three minutes left. Your post-Purdue activities, um, a Purdue tradition and an outstanding event. Okay. Um, Post-Purdue activities, when I retired in 2001, it was to take a position at the Henry Luce Foundation, which um, Claire Booth Luce left her entire estate to the foundation to sponsor a scholarship and fellowship and professorship program for women in science and engineering. 
So after being on this side of the coin at Purdue, begging for money for our programs, now I get to give it away. And it's, I got to tell you, it's a little bit more fun <laughs> to give money away than to beg for it all the time. So that's been really terrific. Um, I've worked there eight years now, and will probably work another three till I retire. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what your Purdue tradition? Purdue tradition, football games, women's basketball. Um, I've been to the Rose Bowl uh, when the Purdue women's basketball team won the national championship in 1999. I was out in San Jose, California. So the athletic traditions have been near and dear to my heart. The um, convocations has always been a special tradition at Purdue from when we first came. And there were the victory varieties after football games with all the famous entertainers. and. Just everything. I think that's right. probably the strongest. Any out, gave you an outstanding event? An outstanding event. I'm going to have to depart from Purdue for just a second for that one. After I moved to New York, our church choir was asked to join um, a mixed choir to do Mendelssohn's Requiem Mass in Carnegie Hall with a live orchestra. And that was the thrill of a lifetime. So that has to be my that's memory great. of all time. <laughs> And in closing, Jane, any, any comment you'd like to say in closing? Just that it's, it's just been a joy, um, first to do the program, to be involved with it and direct it, and now to see where it's still growing and doing wonderful new things and still being recognized as just the very tops in the United States. And that's, that's really fun Good. to see. Thank you very much. This You're welcome. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat>